Well, good evening. Uh, for those of you I've not yet had the chance to meet, my name is John Highbush. I'm the executive director of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you here this evening. After I introduce Mrs. Reagan and her guest, if you would please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance, we would greatly appreciate it. Also, if you have any cell phones or pagers, this would be the time to turn them off. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct honor to introduce the former First Lady of the United States, Nancy Reagan, escorted by Mr. Mort Zuckerman. Now, in honor of our men and women in uniform who defend our freedom around the world, if you'd please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. So before we get started, I would like to recognize some special guests that we have with us tonight. First, uh, from our Board of Trustees, I'd like to introduce the Honorable Anne McLaughlin Coralogos, President Reagan, Secretary of Labor. I'd also like to introduce Duke Blackwood, our Library Director. Duke. And of course, I would personally like to welcome my boss and a terrific First Lady, Mrs. Nancy Reagan. I have to confess, it is a bit intimidating to introduce someone with a stature of Mort Zuckerman. Believe me, when one sits down to prepare the introduction, the first thing that happens when you start reading all of his accomplishments is that you start to kick yourself. A little anxiety sets in. You begin to think, oh, if I had just studied a little harder in school, or if I had worked harder at work, you know, perhaps I could have accomplished as much as he had. Then when you get over feeling sorry for yourself and a bit belittled, set aside your ego and admit the truth, you start to think about all his achievements, you come to a very profound conclusion. You know, I really should have studied harder in school <laughs> or worked harder at work. That aside, it is a matter of very public record that he is the publisher of the New York Daily News and the chairman and editor-in-chief of US News and World Report. Some of you, particularly those who know real estate, may well know him as the co-founder and chairman and CEO of Boston Properties, one of the largest owners, managers, and developers of first-class office properties in the United States. Now, with a little imagination, you can envision how he might have a few minutes to spare in these roles to fit in his numerous appearances providing expert commentary on dozens of places as CNBC, Fox, and PBS, and the McLaughlin Group, and MSNBC, and the list goes on and on. But now, imagine someone who, in addition to all of this, is also a trustee or a member of Memorial Sloan Kettering, the J.P. Morgan National Advisory Board, the International Peace Institute, the Bank of America's Global Wealth and Investment Management Committee, the Council of Foreign Relations, 
the Washington Institute for Near East Studies, the In International Institute of Strategic Studies, and the Broad Center for Management for School Systems. One would think that this is a list of assignments for the entire graduating class at both Wharton and Harvard Law, <laughs> both of which he attended. Uh, not the work of just one man, but indeed it is. Before I ask Mort to come up here, I do want to make sure that I draw an important parallel between this hugely accomplished man and our beloved 40th President, Ronald Reagan. And that is that they shared in common a love for good old-fashioned storytelling, particularly jokes. Anyone who observed President Reagan from up close or from afar could tell that he absolutely delighted in drawing people in or warming up a room or in bringing disparate, disagreeable factions together through wonderful humorous stories and unforgettable one-liners that were apropos to the moment. No one here tonight knows this better than our former First Lady, Nancy Reagan. And this is why I had to smile when uh, several months ago, I remember looking across the beautiful candlelit rotunda of the US Capitol. We were there for a dinner celebrating the unveiling of President Reagan's statue. And what I saw across the room was Mrs. Reagan and her table guests absolutely transfixed on another great storyteller sitting right beside Mrs. Reagan, and it was Mort Zuckerman. That moment seemed picture perfect to me then, and I am sure that President Reagan would have quite approved of his stand-in for the evening. Indeed, there is much history and much to the story that brought President Reagan and Mort Zuckerman together during some very tense days in the fall of 1986. It involves a famous case of Nicholas Daniloff, who worked for Mort, and who under some very trying circumstances was released from captivity because these two great storytellers and great humanitarians were able to persevere together. Whether Mort has time to share that particular story tonight among the others he has brought with him is up to him. But regardless, I am certain you're going to be both impressed and entertained. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Mort Zuckerman. any hesitation in saying that the best part of my evening is already behind me, and that was escorting Nancy Reagan into this room. So thank you very much for that honor. I'm really honored to be here. Um, I was going to try and uh, wait uh, for a little bit before I sort of shared one of the stories that the President and I uh, would uh, share very often in terms of uh, stories. Uh, he always had a point to his stories. This one was, uh, in fact, uh, with the idea of sort of hanging in there and sticking to your guns. Um, uh, and this involved uh, two men who were walking along in Central Park in New York. And they were walking their dogs. And after about an hour, an hour and a half, one of them had a Labrador retriever. The other had a Chihuahua. and. Uh, uh, one of them said, hey, you know, my feet are pretty tired. Why don't we sit down somewhere and grab something to eat? And the guy says, well, the Tavern on the Green is just around the corner. Why don't we go there? He says, I don't think that'll work, uh, says the guy with a chihuahua. They don't allow dogs. They have an absolute rule prohibiting dogs in the dining room. So the man with the Labrador retriever says, look, I tell you what, you follow me, do what I do, and say what I say. And he goes in. And he asks for a table for two. He says, I'm expecting a friend. And Major D says, we'd be delighted to be of service to you. Sir, but we have an absolute rule prohibiting dogs in the dining room. The man says, well, I, I understand. He says, but I'm sure you have an exception for handicapped people. You see, I'm completely blind. This is a seeing eye dog. I'm totally helpless and dependent on this dog. I can't go anywhere without him. Major D says, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize that. Of course, we'll take you in. Next in comes his friend with a chihuahua, and he says, <laughs> I'm, expected for, uh, I'm expected for lunch with a friend of mine. I know he's awaiting me in the dining room. He said, well, sir, we have an absolute rule prohibiting dogs. I'm afraid I can't have you join them. He says, well, I understand. He says, uh, but uh, you see, um, I'm sure you don't realize this. I'm completely blind. I'm totally helpless and dependent on this dog. I can't go anywhere without him. And the maitre d' says, 
your seeing eye dog is a chihuahua? And the guy says, they gave me a chihuahua? <laughs> so, now, I, I, I confess to you, I, I love stories like this. And it was a special joy for me to be able to spend time with the president and Mrs. Reagan and listen to him tell stories, all of which were apropos. And the time where I really got the greatest opportunity to meet with him and to observe him and his senior staff at work did involve um, this uh, extraordinary story involving a man by the name of Nick Danilov, who was our Moscow bureau chief. He spoke fluent Russian, um, and uh, his family was uh, Russian. And he got uh, jumped by the KGB. The circumstances were really quite interesting. We, uh, the United States, that is, captured a Russian who was in the process of paying for and buying the plans for uh, metals that were heat resistant, which are useful for rockets and for jet engines. And there is a protocol, or was a protocol at that point, that if we captured uh, a, a Soviet spy, uh, he would be released in the name of his ambassador if his ambassador showed up, but his ambassador was new and apparently didn't know what the protocol was, never showed up, so he gets put in jail. Um, then uh, Nick Danilov gets put in jail. He gets captured and thrown into uh, a Soviet prison. And uh, we, we were just astonished by it. I found out about this on a Saturday morning. I was playing softball. And I came back to my home, and I had a stack of messages, emergency, emergency. Nick Danilov, our Moscow correspondent, was thrown into the jug. And I called, uh, was able to call somebody at the State Department, and they filled me in a little bit of it. And I said, well, I've got to go there. I mean, I can't leave this man sitting there in prison by himself. He said, well, we'll have trouble with getting you a visa. I said, no, you won't. You get me a visa. I'm going the next morning. And I did go the next morning. And um, I spent, uh, there was a, an organization called the USA Canada Institute there, headed up by a man by the name of Yorgi Arbatov. And uh, he, that was the major platform for any kind of dialogue, including a lot of the dialogue about arms control that happened through that organization. And he arranged for me to meet the various mint people in the foreign ministry. And the foreign minister actually said to me, look, this is not a foreign ministry matter. It's a KGB matter. Well, they had somebody in the USA Canada Institute who had been with the uh, KGB. Surprise, surprise. And he ends up arranging me for me to meet the three-star general in charge of the case who makes it very clear that the whole purpose of this was to have trading bait to get this guy, uh, their, their, their uh, spy, out. Well, we went back and forth, and then I went back to uh, the United States, and I ended up uh, going into the White House for the better part of four weeks and meeting with the senior staff as we tried to figure out how to make this thing look reasonably appropriate for the United States. We didn't want it to be a one-for-one -one exchange because Nick Daniloff was not a spy and this other guy was. Um, and ultimately, we uh, achieved that by getting uh, released amongst, uh, in addition to Nick Daniloff, a man by the name of Yuri Orloff, who was uh, the, one of the leaders of the resistance uh, uh, and the number two guy to Andrei Sakharov, uh, a famous Russian dissident, and he was released in the, in the process. But in that period of three or four weeks, I had the chance to meet on a regular basis with the president, and it was fabulous, folks. It was just wonderful. Um, he was, he got the issue every time. He was right on point. Um, he was very decisive, and everybody understood why he was making his decisions, and uh, followed along uh, with his guidance. And it was a fascinating experience for me, and, and I have to say I, I was given this wonderful tour of the library, and it brought back so many of the memories that I was fortunate to have by sharing some time with the President and with uh, Mrs. Reagan. Uh, so it's already been a wonderful evening for me, and I thank you all for coming here to um, uh, listen to me. I, I, what, what, you, what you came away with uh, when you met with the president, it was number one, he had an absolutely, uh, he was completely optimistic. It was an absolutely boundless optimism. And uh, he also had this, not just an ability to tell jokes, but he had a self deprecating sense of humor and uh, uh, a kind of charm that was totally lacking of any kind of conceit. 
And all of this was leavened by this wonderful sense of humor that he brought to everything. So it was a real joy to work with him and to listen to him speak in the kind of clear and plain language that enabled him to connect with so many people in America and indeed with his senior staff. So he provided what, in fact, I think America's most wanted then and now, uh, which is uh, uh, a strong leader who could and would lead. And uh, to borrow a phrase that was used for another political leader whom um, he knew very well, Margaret Thatcher, uh, this man was not for turning. Uh, when he had his views and he had clear views, boy, he stuck to them. And everybody really respected it and stood by him and respected him for us. Now, he came into office when the United States was mired in um, an economic and even psychological downturn. He knew that more of the same just would not do. And he was able to convince the public that it was time for a change in direction. And he spoke to and created a vision about where we were coming from, where we were going, where we were headed, what was to be feared, and what was to be dreamed. Uh, if I may say, he personified what Harry Truman's definition of a leader was, to wit, a man who had the ability to get other people to do what they don't want to do and to like it. <laughs> this is no small accomplishment, and it was never easy, even when he made it look easy, which he did on just about every front. As Winston Churchill once said, success is the ability to go from one failure to another with no loss of enthusiasm. <laughs> well, when you're in politics, you need that, and he had it, uh, and the whole country was infected by it and uh, wonderfully inspired by it. And how we miss that quality of leadership today. Uh, it is our political system, as much as anything else, that raises some of our gravest national concerns. Today, too much of our leadership passes off tough decisions to some other body or to some future generation. We have been witness to a political vacuum, and indeed, and it's sad to say, a level of political corruption that has dismayed the entire country. And it's given the country a sense of a government that is in disarray, unable to make the wise and tough decisions to get things done for the American people and to solve the problems of our nation. This was supposed to be a time when we changed politics as usual. And when I was asked about this in another context, I said, yes, we changed politics as usual. The problem is we changed them for the worse and not for the better. And that's what's happened. And as a result of that, less than 20% of the American public now approve of the way Congress is doing its job. And our president has suffered the sharpest and largest drop in approval ratings in, for any president in the modern era. And just to show you what's happening, folks, here is somebody, a very successful governor of New Jersey in the Wall Street Journal. The headline is Reaganism New Jersey Style. So President Reagan's views are coming back. Um, and I think that's quite wonderful because he was a leader who knew how to instill confidence in a nation that had lost its way. That is why America felt so good about him and better about themselves when they listen to him. And that is why I feel so honored to speak in this building dedicated to his legacy. So now I'd like, if I may, to share some thoughts with you about where I think the country is and where I think we're going to have to go in order to get back the spirit that we uh, have lost, or at least that has been compromised. There's, there are good news days and bad news days. But altogether, Americans are a little sadder these days. Everyone seems to be talking about decline and recession, about an aging America that no longer leads the world and is falling behind a rejuvenated China. Once uh, we had the air of what Mark Twain described as the serene confidence of a poker player with four aces, no more. We worry that we are losing our technology lead and we've seen this in the shift from having a big surplus, uh, trade surplus in high-tech uh, products uh, uh, just seven or eight years ago, and today we have a huge deficit in these products. We worry that our children will not enjoy the opportunities that we so long have taken for granted. We worry that our runaway financial system is not fixed and our health care problems are not really solved. We face trillion-dollar deficits as far as the eye can see. 
Hardly anybody, it seems, has confidence anymore in our governmental system. It is not surprising that Democrats and Republicans now vote against each other more regularly than at any time since Reconstruction. The U.S. Senate has had to break more filibusters in 2009 alone than in the 1950s and 1960s combined. There is a sign, a sigh rather, of too true in Mansur Olson's contention in his book, The Rise and Decline of Nations, that one of the consequences of institutional aging is the creation of a culture of entitlement, where special interest groups inevitably take bite after tiny bite out of the total national wealth through tax breaks, special appropriations, earmarks, and other favors that are all easier to initiate than to end. Yes, yes, but sadness should not give way to despair. If the new frontier of the world today is the global economy, we are as well placed to exploit that as we were in the new continental marketplace of a century ago. And think of how adaptable we were. In 1800, America was a nation of farmers with about three quarters of the labor force in agriculture. Today, agriculture employs less than 3% of the workforce, and food is cheaper and more plentiful than ever. And troublesome as the trans transition is, we rely, rely less and less on the old industrial economy, which now makes up 10% of the economy, the workforce, compared to a third of just 30 or 40 years ago. Yes, we are challenged in technology, but our fast in investments and high-tech training our vast investments excuse me, in high-tech training have increased quality control, improved information systems to adjust supply, prices, and output more quickly. Today, we spend twice as much per capita on infotech as Western European firms and eight times as much as the global average. We have replaced large mass-produced consumer products with sophisticated goods derived from intellectual content and output and knowledge-based industries now the fastest growing segments of the world's economy. Management has been assisted by a labor flexibility that is the envy both of Europe, whose legacy is one of management demarcations by unions and crafts, and of Asia, where management is stifled by large oligopolistic networks and government mandates. American history uniquely encouraged the development of a culture of enterprise and management. How else? Could, serve, could we serve a market stretching vast distances over mountains, deserts, and rivers? How else to meet the needs of a diverse population? Psychologically, our business culture has long valued individualism, entrepreneurialism, pragmatism, and novelty, along with an abiding respect for the rule of law by which the country was founded. So American business came to be dominated by contract and law rather than by kinship and custom not by primogenitor, but by merit and a common belief in technology and scientific management. It was an American, Frederick Winslow Taylor, who pioneered the time and motion study, and an American who developed the assembly line. Our people are mobile physically and mentally and psychologically. No other country has a population so driven to self-help, self-improvement, and even self-renovation. No other country invests so much in training and retraining, not to mention the largest and best graduate and undergraduate schools, especially business schools, in the world. No other country draws so many of the world's best and brightest to its labs and universities. Of the world's top 20 universities, 17 are American. None is Chinese. The young Chinese and Indians and Brazilians and Europeans know that they will have a level of opportunity in America and the possibility for participating in the businesses that stem out of innovation beyond what they will have at home. China's public spending on education for a population four times as large as the United States is about one third of that in the United States. No other country sees its most talented people move so overwhelmingly into the private sector where the most successful are rewarded as symbols in a nation of doers. Blue chip companies no longer have a lock on recruiting the best and the brightest. Instead, they compete with thousands of small, smaller companies, roughly two million created in the last decade alone, that have the potential to blossom and grow even as thousands have gone belly up. 
And as soon as new products and services are developed, American businesses' unique marketing and advertising skills have the potential to establish their success at home and abroad. It is true that they have reduced their print advertising, but I'm sure sooner or later they'll see the wisdom of that. <laughs> We are even better suited for today's rapidly growing knowledge-based economy than for the mass production industrial economy. We grow from the grassroots in a way that en enhances our capacity to absorb, adapt to, and manage ongoing revolutions in technology, information, and logistics that are too dynamic and complex to be handled by a top-down system. This is how we are able to marry a new economy to an older economic culture. Everything about American society nurtures the traits that should offer the greatest rewards to the industries and technologies of the, f of the future. Flexibility, openness, reinvention, and a get-up-and-go spirit. America is the only country that funds so many of its young, who are the most comfortable and creative with the new technologies. We are increasingly funding the future, not the past, the new and not the old. And this is not short-term capital, but long-term risk investments reflecting a merit-based, diversified financial environment and recognizing that only when there is money to back good ideas will the necessary economic synergies emerge. To all of this, we must add America's cultural sway in the world. Seven of the ten most watched TV shows around the world are American. Avatar is both a technological advance and the world's top grossing film. U.S. nationals from McDonald's to Nike book more than half of their revenues overseas. To a greater extent than anything else, what binds the people of the world together is American culture. Music, the world of Hollywood, the electronic games, Google, American consumer brands, the list goes on and on. We are still living in an American century, even as it frays a bit at the edges. The notion of American exceptionalism still endures. Worry has always preceded reform in America. We have had periods of decline and loss of confidence as we have now, but we have always bounced back. We are not, at least most of us, subservient to some outdated theory or attached to some ideology. We are a country that is able to adapt. This is something that we must do and that we can do. And if we don't do it, it is not because we can't do it, it's because we won't do it and because we aren't strong enough to put forth a government that addresses the real issues in real time. I'm going to stop there and I'll be very happy to answer questions now for the rest of this time. Thank you very, very much for listening. Uh, Mort's been gracious enough to uh, take questions. We've got a few minutes for some, so if anyone has a question, if you could raise your hand. We have people in the aisles uh, with microphones, and uh, if you could just wait till you get that in your hand to answer the question. We have one right over here, and then we'll come back. Do you believe um, that Congress should be have term limits, and if so, why, and if no, why? Well, actually, I don't believe the Congress should have term limits, in part because uh, governing is not something that is a pickup game. And frankly, you would hope that people after more years in the Congress could learn a lot more about government and about the policies that they have to enact and the policies that they have to review. I do think, however, that, and I have to say this, it's not just our politicians. Um, there is something about our media which has so polarized the political dialogue and the media has contributed to it. But the, the real problem is that we have a system in which you do not have a legislative body that works. You do not have two legislative bodies, the, Cong the Senate and the House. You have 535 legislative bodies, and you have to find a way to organize them. And I would say to you and that there are various things that I think ought to be done to deal with it. And one of them is we have to find a way to get the Congress to act more, more folk, in a more focused way and in a swifter way. And one of those issues is going to be to try and deal with the filibuster. The filibuster, by the way, is not in the, in the Constitution. It came about as a result of the fact that in the order of the way Congress uh, proceeds with its business, there was a way of uh, stopping it, and they took it away. Um, in, uh, casual, and then they realized what it produced. It produced nonstop rhetoric. 
So first, they had a filibuster that was introduced by the Congress with 67 votes in the Senate. Now it's down to 60 votes. I do think it is not working any longer. And we have to find some more effective procedural way to get legislation through the Congress without making it hostage to a very small group, particularly in the Senate, who can block things. This is just not going to be workable in today's day and age. I don't know if that's going to be possible because some party is going to have to accept that and it never is the party that has the majority or the blocking vote in the Congress. But we have to find some way to have the kind of leadership from the president. It is the presidential. Um, uh, this is a system of government that works best when the president shows the right kind of leadership and has the right kind of public support. The president has to be able to go to the people and get the Congress to bend to the will of the people. That is what President Reagan was able to do, and that it was our president. What our president has now lost. It's really sad that it's happened, but that's the way it works. Uh, yes, right here. Our nation is uh, facing a national debt of $12.7 trillion. Next year, we're proposing to spend $1.6 trillion more than we take in. Um, Medicare and Social Security are woefully underfunded. I think one in, in your editorial many years ago, you referred to it as a Ponzi scheme. Um, how long is this sustainable before we just completely implode? And how do we go about turning that um, in a way that, you know, when you try to reduce programs, it's, it's completely shot, shot, shot uh, down? Well, I, I thank you for referring to one of my more effective editorials. <laughs> um, look, I, I think you are focused on a huge issue because it is so easy for Congress to say, well, it's not going to be my problem. It's the next Congress or the next you know, four years or six years or eight years. But there's no doubt that these problems are going to affect us. Now, I will tell you, it is my belief now that for the first time in decades, the American public is really concerned about the debt of this country, and for a reason that they understand. So many Americans have mortgages that exceed the value of their homes or credit card lines that they can't afford, and they now realize, hey, that debt is coming due and I have to pay it. And they realize it's also going to be true for the country. So I think that is a very, very good issue politically now to, to really campaign against it. And I believe, I may be wrong in this thing, nobody knows it's seven months away. I think these congressional elections are going to show a very, very real difference in terms of the public response to the issue of the national indebtedness. We are putting off, we are putting ourselves into a situation where our children and grandchildren will have so much debt that the country will have assumed that their own futures will be compromised and limited. And all the opportunities that somebody like myself had, those opportunities will be drastically limited. The country in some mysterious way understands that. What I think we are going to need and what I hope we find is a different level of leadership at the Congress and frankly at some point at the national level. That, I do think that there is an awareness of that now that has not existed for a long time. There is a price to be paid for the debt. People are paying for it individually in their families. They know that the country is going to have to pay it too. Yes, right over here. I was wondering, I, I heard some remarks by Mayor Bloomberg of New York, that inadvertently or purposefully, uh, the current administration, through all sorts of legislation, especially the financial reforms coming up, has almost got it out for New York City, that, that, it was, that the city is not being helped particularly and is taking more than its fair share of lumps, if you comment. Well, um, the mayor is certainly concerned about that and for good reason. Um, the financial industry is the largest industry in New York City, the largest taxpayer in New York City, and the largest industry in the state, and the largest taxpayer. Uh, the focus, of course, is on those people who have made these humongous salaries and incomes. But the fact is that the average salary of the people who work in the financial industry is in the range of $75,000. It is a huge employer, and it is critical to the New York City economy and to the New York State economy. And in fact, it is also critical to the national economy. We have an economic system that is lubricated by the financial system. Without a healthy banking system and a healthy financial world, the economy is going to get into real difficulty. So I frankly supported 
some of the efforts, and maybe not all of them, to save the financial system, because if we had not done that, and we were very close to the edge on that, we would have really had a major, major economic downturn, much worse than the one we've had now. And we've had a very serious economic downturn. And those economic downturns that are initiated by a financial crisis, which this one was, take much longer to get out of. And we are nowhere near the bottom of it, and nowhere near the end of it. But having said that, there is, it seems to me, also a role for appropriate regulation. It is ridiculous to allow a lot of the banks to get as leveraged as they were. And they were leveraged, and they were leveraged not just in terms of what appeared on the balance sheet, but they had many off-balance sheet entities where there was additional amounts of leverage. Uh, Citigroup, for example, had in what is called an SIV, a structured investment vehicle, $160 billion of this kind of mortgage-backed securities. Um, and they lost a fortune on this, and nobody understood quite what they had invested in. And everybody assumed that the world can, would continue just to grow and grow and grow. That, but n nothing ever grows forever, and nobody understood the risks. So the only way to deal with that, it seems to me, is through an intelligent regulatory system. But an intelligent regulatory system should not be one that really makes it impossible for the financial system to lubricate the economy, which is its principal role. And that is where I think the, there is now a populist sentiment in which there is, it is easy to attack the people in the world of finance, and the way they do it is now to attack the basic economics and business structure of the world of finance and business model of it. Now, let, let's take an example. Take the banks. Uh, there has been a suggestion that the banks should not be involved in what is called proprietary trading, pr trading in a sense for their own account. Now, this does not mean that they're using bank capital that is specifically to be devoted to insuring the deposits. They're not allowed to do that. But with their own profits, they are allowed to do that. Now, if you took this away, the banks are in such terrible shape that the banks would have no way of getting back on their feet and becoming uh, you know, active again as lenders. They would become zombie banks. They would look alive, but they'd basically be dead. The country that, in fact, had a similar experience with Japan, and for a whole decade, their financial system was inoperative, and their economy is still much worse today, relative to everybody else, than any other major economy. So we have to make sure that we avoid that. Again, the problem that we have is that it's so easy to demagogue these in populist terms and make it appeal to a constituency who looks upon some of the people, and rightly so, in the financial world as somehow or other have made a huge amount of money while, in a sense, um, they had to be bailed up by the banks. They took such risks, and who ended up paying the, the cost of the risk? The public. Now, it so happens the way it's working out, if you follow the, the investments that they made in the banks, the government is gradually getting this money back and, in fact, maybe making a modest profit. And in the process, they save the financial system. So it does deserve some re-regulation, but not a degree of re-regulation, in my judgment that will, in effect, greatly inhibit that financial world. It is not just a part of our national system. It is a great part of our international prestige and power, because we are the world's leading financial power, and the world's leading financial power in the sense that any time there is a major transaction, basically they look to the American financial institutions to take the lead. So it was a very important part of our whole economy. Now, the, the issue, though, is that there are a lot of people in Congress who can make a lot of easy political points by just talking about these terrible people who've made so much money and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. Uh, as you can see, I don't share that view, and I think it's a very dangerous view, and I don't know how we get it out of con under control unless the executive branch says we're not going to stand for that. Well, that's not what's happening. The executive branch is leading the charge on this kind of populism. It's a false populism, in my judgment, and a dangerous one. It's not that it isn't something that we all feel, because there was something wrong with the way that they were able to take risks and make these huge profits and get these huge salaries. But let's deal with that issue and not by, in effect, destroying the financial system that has served us well for a very long time. Uh, yes, right here. Say is a great leader in the world today. Is a great leader in the world today? Well, um, no. This is a very serious question, and uh, I do think um, uh, it, 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 I'm, I'm sorry if I'm I'm not instantly coming up with some. I have to be <laughs> honest with you. Wasn't it somebody who said, you know, give me 24 hours and I'll come back with an answer? <laughs> um, 
I, I, I'm, I'm, there isn't a political leader that instantly, in my, to my mind, comes to, to, to the fore. Uh, there are individual leaders in smaller countries. But, um, you know, I have to say, I by and large think that the British political leadership has been relatively wise in the management of their own system. Um, but we, we need somebody who, in a sense, can take the international lead. I, I will also say to you that the, the Chinese leadership has been much more constructive than anybody had reason to expect. Um, I would not say that about the Russian leadership. Um, they've had a, a huge financial crash because they had speculation based on corruption. Um, um, I was asked, uh, frankly, to uh, become, without going into how it all happened, I knew the mayor of Moscow, and he, when he came to New York, I hosted him, and I had a dinner for him at my home. He, uh, my uh, wife at that point was pregnant, and I can only say to you, when he would give an answer, and the answers would go on for 30 or 40 minutes, um, and then you had to have it translated, um, one, of, one of my friends said to my wife sitting at another table, he said, it's all right with me if you go into labor right now. So, <laughs> uh, um, but, I mean, they, they uh, said I could build every high-rise building in Moscow above the level of 30 stories. Why? Because he had built a, a, an athletic facility, which essentially was like a private club and for him and for his colleagues. Um, and I, would, I played tennis with him there many times. Uh, the scores generally went as follows. 6-1 the first set, 4-6 um, the second set, and 6 all in the third set. I don't know how it worked out that way. It just seemed to work out that way. Um, and so he offered me this great opportunity, he thought. And I said, I, I don't think I'm interested. He said, somebody to New York. He said, why not? He said. Well, I said, I didn't know quite how to put it because it was so kind. I said, I'm not comfortable with your system. Well, the guy got the message, and then they sent the head of the Dumas Budget Committee who said, we will protect you from the system. Now, the notion that I would put my hands, my future in the hands of these guys, you know, that they will protect me from this. I mean, they had no idea. that For them, this was perfectly natural. So that system is, the, the corruption there is beyond anything we could ever imagine. It is probably fair to say that Putin, who's a very, very, very intelligent, very interesting man, but Putin is probably the wealthiest man in the world today. I mean, these are extraordinary things. He worked very hard at it, got above the minimum wage, but still. <laughs> So uh, uh, there, there really is not a major international leader today with the kind of moral authority that you really need to change the world. And again, a part of that uh, comes out of, by and large, us, for a long time, the United States. I mean, we are the leader of the world, certainly the leader of the free world. But our leader has to have a particular kind of moral authority and toughness. And that combination is a very difficult thing to come by. Um, in a sense, George Bush, I think, had toughness, but he did not have the moral authority. I thought Bill Clinton for a long time had both for a while. Um, uh, it wasn't something he kept for his entire term, but <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe the way I'm speaking. I'm so <laughs> Why don't I move on? I, 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 I have to think of somebody. Even the, the Ban Ki-moon, who is the, the, the head of the United Nations, who's a very, very fine man, yet he has no, again, no, no public voice and no moral authority. We need somebody to be able to speak that way. And that's a very difficult uh, ingredient to come by. And frankly, it doesn't exist, at least in, uh, that it, with anybody that I can think of. Sir. Uh, Mr. Zuckerman, thank you for an uh, excellent address. Uh, along the lines of the last question, you mentioned your, in your uh, introductory remarks the uniqueness of President Reagan as a, a leader yeah. and a strong will. And you also mentioned the importance of leadership qualities uh, in our president, particularly in our particular form of government. Who, uh, in your estimation, are people that are out there that can emulate the uniqueness of Ronald Reagan? And if you know who they, and if you know who they are, can you discuss that this evening? Well, I think uh, uh, the lady right here was going to ask me about General Petraeus. And I have to say, I think that he is somebody who uh, is extraordinarily intelligent and thoughtful, and in his own sphere, which was really critical for us because uh, he really saved 
what could have been a disastrous defeat in Iraq for a disastrous for this country, uh, he really uh, hung in there under great political pressure. Now, a, a, a man who is a military man at this stage of the game, it's hard for us to really be able to determine whether or not he will translate into politics, but uh, I, he is somebody whom I think does have, at least from the basis of my own meetings, who does have that kind of quality. I've had several meetings with him, not by myself, but with a small group. In fact, I think if I had to say the um, Admiral Mullen, who was, uh, was uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, um, there have been a whole series of people coming out of the military who seem to have both the intellectual background and the the political guts and the personal guts to be real leaders. I mean, we are um, developing real leaders in the military. Uh, we are not developing too many real leaders in our political system, which has become so corrupted by the huge amounts of money that has to be raised for anybody's political campaign. And you have this feeling of um, a political system that has gone completely awry. So I, I, can't, I can almost not think of anybody in our political system I hope somebody emerges, frankly, who will have the, I mean, I'll, tell, I'll give you somebody who is, um, I think, an extraordinary leader, is the mayor of New York. Um, I say this with some uh, uh, degree of serious uh, awareness of what he has done as the mayor, and I will tell you that the New York Daily News was the only newspaper to endorse him the first time he ran, and it's, that endorsement was ca what, what carried him to victory. Now. I had the advantage in that he and I were both on the board of the Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton. And he came in, and I, I, I didn't know him well at that point. And he, took, he, he, he went to the senior group and said, look, what are the major problems? There were four major issues. He says, why don't you leave one of them in my hand? And which they did. And quietly, by himself, he worked that problem, and in two years, he resolved it and moved on. And I thought to myself, that's really, really impressive. And that's how he came to be endorsed by the Daily News. Uh, and he has been an extraordinary mayor, and he's done a lot of things that I think took real leadership. Um, banning smoking, which, by the way, is a huge political issue. Um, trying to change the trans fats in the uh, restaurant business. Uh, really running a very tough budget um, and refusing to uh, you know, run deficits, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it would be very nice to know that there is somebody who, in a sense, could take a position that had more than a short-term political benefit or cost, who was willing to, to sort of hang in there for the longer term. I think that's the best politics. I just said everybody seems to want to win the evening news contest. And that's the feeling that you have, that we have politicians uh, in our main offices and not leaders. And that's a very, you see it in business. You see real leaders in business. Um, um, not, uh, many of them don't want to go into public life. But I think we need to find some way to attract those kinds of people into public life. I think we have time for one last question right over here. Thank you. Uh, uh, today, uh, Haaretz reported that uh, Israeli nuclear scientists are no longer persona grata in the United States. Please comment on the uh, deteriorating relationships between the Obama administration and the uh, country of Israel. Well, that's a tough issue uh, for me, and I'm going to declare my hand. I have been working, I worked for President Clinton for three years as his back channel to the Israelis. Um, and I went back and forth 50 times in that period of time. And, uh, and I've worked ever since then to bring about a two-state solution. And uh, what I have uh, written and said publicly, and I'll repeat it here, is I don't think this administration understands how to play the game. They started off by imposing... <laughs> they started off by imposing the standard of a settlement freeze, which had never before been an imposition to a dialogue between the Israelis and the Palestinians. But the Palestinian leader quite rightly says, I cannot be less Palestinian than the American president. If he calls for a settlement freeze, I have to call for a settlement freeze. Well, they finally worked that out, and the Israeli prime minister, I must say to his credit, for the first time of any Israeli prime minister, introduced a 10-month moratorium on new construction in the settlements, with the exception of Jerusalem. And then on the basis of what really was a technical issue, 
It was the fourth stage of a seven-stage zoning approval process, and nobody understands those better than Californians. This has been on, in, go, on, and it's a process that's already taken three years to get through the fourth stage. It'll take another three years uh, to get through the next three stages, and even then, the construction will not begin. But Jerusalem is the core and the center of Israeli public life. No Israeli politician can agree not to build in Jerusalem. Nobody could survive that. The whole country is united behind that by some overwhelming margin. And so to now put in as a standard a change in the policy which has existed for 43 years uh, is once again to cause what happened when he put in the settlement freeze, to delay the direct dialogue between the Palestinians and the Israelis, which is the only way this issue will be resolved. It is the way Oslo came about. It is the way the, dialogues bet the dialogue between uh, the uh, Israelis and the Egyptians came about. It all happens privately. And why does it happen privately? Because each side has to make concessions. And if you make it publicly, the concessions on each side come out on every issue, and neither uh, uh, side have a, has a politics that can withstand that. So they can't get anything done publicly. And if it's going to be done privately, it cannot be done in the context where you establish some public standard, in this case now no construction in Jerusalem, that is simply going to be unacceptable to one side, or, on, or no, settlement, no settlement activity. It doesn't mean that there won't be an agreement. There have been agreements on the settlements already on many levels. And it is against all the previous commitments of previous American governments to the Israelis. So the Israelis are left in limbo at this stage of the game. But in any event, no negotiations are being carried on because the standard has been set unrealistically. It is my belief, and I've been working on this for a very long time, that in fact, the, the substance of the disagreements are really quite small. What is difficult is the politics on both sides. You have tremendously emotional politics on both sides. And so the only way to reach an agreement and make it stick is you reach the whole agreement. You make all the compromises, but you have the major gains on both sides, on the Palestinian side, it would be a state. And on the Israeli side, it would be a resolution of the conflict. There will be compromises that a lot of people on both sides would not like. But in the context of the entire agreement, it will be acceptable to both sides. That's the only way to do it. And every administration in the past has understood it until this administration came into power. And I hope that they learn from their mistakes. I really thought they had. What happened is something that is almost mysterious. It is not a strategy. It is not a tactic. It is something that is some kind of an attitudinal view to this whole issue, and I think it is very counterproductive to what we want to accomplish and to what I think can be accomplished. So with that, I will just say this. I hope it works. I hope it gets resolved. Uh, otherwise, I've wasted a hell of a lot of time. <laughs> and I'm not going to give up on it. I mean, if there ever was uh, something where the definition of genius is lasting five minutes longer than the other side, it's the Israeli-Palestinian dispute. But I think it can be done. I think. The Israeli prime minister wants to do it. The Palestinian leader wants to do it. The real problem, frankly, is the way the United States has played this issue. Anyways, you have all been wonderful to me, and I want to thank Mrs. Reagan once again. Thank you. I also want to thank you, John, because the, the time, the hour, hour and a half you spent with me, uh, again, as I said before, brought back a lot of wonderful memories of the great opportunity I had to work with the President. And I thank you very much for giving me the chance to relive those moments. Thanks so much, Mike. Excellent. Just terrific. terrific. Well, it was as terrific as, as we all knew it would be. Um, thank you all so much for coming this evening. It's just been fantastic. Uh, I would ask if all of you could please remain in your seats for just a moment while Mrs. Reagan and her guests have a chance to depart. It would be great. Thank you so much for joining us.